millions of years ago, on a beautiful island, in the middle of a jungle, there was a habitat teeming with life. In a small pool of water, there lived a very happy and loving family of fish. Every day in the life of this family was filled with fun swimming in the warm, clean waters and eating plenty of fresh food. There was never a dull moment for this family. Until one dry season, when the water in their pool began to evaporate. Day by day, the water withered, and there was no sign of rain in the sky. The family was scared and panicky, as they knew that the ultimate end of their species was upon them. Just when all hope was lost, a young, healthy fish cried out for their attention. They looked over at him and saw something they had never seen before. For this fish had the genes to grow legs and walk on land. No longer would he be bound by the water, limited by its shrinking state. He was going to walk on land. And as he took his first few heroic steps on dry ground and his first breath of air, he suffocated. But luckily, there was another fish with legs who also had the genes to breathe out of water. He then turned around to wave goodbye to his dying family when he was burned to death by the scorching sun. Yet another fish came along with legs and lungs, and the scales on his back were tough as stone, which no sun could scorch. He traversed the land determined to survive, but his weak eyes failed him, and he fell down a hole and died. Another fish came, who was lucky enough to have been born with all the previous fish's genes. Plus, he had a gene that gave him perfect vision. He used his superior sight to find food, but no food existed on land that could be digested by his stomach, and so he starved to death. The next fish stepped up with an advantage over the others. He had a stomach fit for land food. One day, as he grazed on the fresh food, he fell victim to a larger, more fit land animal who made a meal out of him. The fish after that, along with all the previous genes, was endowed with a gene to make him larger and less eatable. He used his size to climb his way to the top of the food chain, where he lived for a long time. He lived life to the fullest and grew old. He had been naturally selected over all of his lesser fit brothers to survive, but without a mate to help pass his genes on, the fate of his species came to an end as he lay on the ground waiting for the maggots to decompose his filthy remains. Will not another fish come and save this species? Yes! Just then, a better fish than all who preceded him came equipped with so many genes that there was nothing on dry land that could bring him down. Plus, he had a wife. So he and his wife bore children and lived for a long time. When finally, the rain began to pour again. The fish was so excited, he gathered all his children and wife and jumped into a pool where they all drowned. Good morning, risers. How you guys doing this morning? Welcome, welcome, welcome. You're awake, you're alive. I'm so excited you're with us this morning. If you're new to our church, my name is Brent. I'm your lead pastor. And uh, we want to celebrate as we get started. Um, last week, we had three people make decisions for Christ in our church. Isn't that awesome? Yep, yep. Always, always, always beautiful. Uh, also, I want to mention this. Uh, in the previous service, he was in here, so we honored him. He may still be in here now. I'm not sure, but uh, yep, he's right there in the back. So uh, Bob French, we, we try to do a volunteer spotlight the first Sunday of every month, and we just volunteer somebody or, or uh, spotlight a different volunteer. And Bob is just killing it. Um, Bob has been volunteering all over the place during the week. A lot of things that you won't normally see, pressure washing things, cleaning things up, going to Sam's and picking stuff up for us, just being absolutely amazing. And he's back there in the back. Would you put your hands together for Bob? Yeah.
Yeah, we, we brought him on stage and gave him a gift in the first service. We won't do that in here. He hates being in front of people and hates the recognition, but I think it's good for him. And uh, hey, he's the one that, if you recall, back at Christmas time, he was dressed up as Santa Claus, which totally threw me off, by the way, because uh, he had asked me a couple weeks before, is it okay if I dress as Santa Claus on the parking team? And I'm like, sure. And I had forgotten all about it. And then on Sunday morning, I'm not usually out there because I'm kind of inside all the time, you know. And, and so Sunday morning, I come up to preach, and he's sitting like right there where the Snyders are right now. He's sitting like right there, and Santa Claus is in front of me. And so for like the first five or ten minutes of the message, all I could think about was, why is Santa Claus? Why is there some? What fool is dressed like Santa Claus in our church service this morning? And about ten minutes into it, it dawned on me what was going on. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, Bob, thank you so much for all you do in our church. You're amazing. One more time, yeah. Anybody ever grow up watching the Beverly Hillbillies? Yes. The 1993 movie, The Beverly Hillbillies, is one of my favorite movies of all time. Hands down, one of my favorite movies. It is absolutely so funny. Um, I know it's cheesy as all get out. Some of you don't get it, but I come from that hillbilly family, so I kind of recognize it. And, and the whole idea is like these country folks come into the Beverly Hills. They come into the city and how that kind of happens. And that's where all the comedy stems from. And... and as Christians, this is the way that some people look at us when it comes to science and the Bible. It's like, all right, we're smart, we're educated over here, but all those Christian believers, they're like unscientific, anti-scientific. They don't know what they're talking about. They're just backwoods, podunk, hillbillies. They have no idea what's going on in the real world. They're just anti-science. I think this really stems uh, from the Scopes trials. Anybody ever heard of the Scopes trials? In 1925, there were these things called Scopes trials. It was a trial between a high school uh, biology professor, high school biology teacher uh, named Mr. Scopes, and uh, he taught evolution. And in 1925 in Dayton, Tennessee, it was against the law to teach evolution in schools. And so he purposely taught evolution so that he would be fine, so that it would go to trial. And so he goes to trial, and um, uh, during this trial, this pretty radical thing happens. It became a national news story. It was chaos. Um, so many people were trying to get into the building and such that they actually moved the trial outside of the building. That's what a big news story was. It was the first trial to ever be put on public radio live. People were listening to the trial all over the place. It was a big, big, big deal. And there were two attorneys involved in the trial. The one on the left is Clarence Darrow. Clarence Darrow was supported by the, or supplied by the ACLU, and he was arguing uh, 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 for evolution and arguing that you should be allowed to teach it in the schools. The other guy is William Jennings Bryan. He was the uh, uh, attorney on the other side, and he was arguing that it should be creation only. And what they quickly found out is that the, the trial wasn't really about did he break the law or not, because he was guilty, and that was blatantly obvious. In fact, he was found guilty. They actually won the trial. People don't realize that. Uh, he was found guilty and had to pay, I think, a $100 fine, which in 1925 is pretty healthy. Um, and so he was found guilty, but it, the trial became about something other than that. Because Clarence Darrow was kind of a New York, northern, intellectual, extremely smart, probably the greatest attorney of his time, very articulate with his words, very uh, profound with the way he said things, you know. And then William Jennings Bryan was kind of the good old country boy. Uh, if we were here in Florida, we'd call him a Florida cracker, right? He's just country boy through and through, backwoods, you know. And he was a believer, and the, uh, uh, the guy from the north, uh, uh, Mr. Darrow, was an agnostic. And so when they came into trial, they quickly found out they weren't really going to try whether or not he taught evolution. That was obviously he was guilty. So what they tried instead was the Bible. And Mr. Bryan allowed himself to be put on stage, or on, 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 on uh, what's that called? He, to be put uh, on the stand, thank you. He allowed himself to be put on the stand and be questioned about the Bible. The problem is he was a good old boy, country guy. He was not a pastor, a theologian, a Bible scholar. And he was literally probably the worst person to put on the stand. And so he got put on the stand and the other attorney started drilling him about questions about creation and the Bible. And what all of America heard really quickly was this intelligent intellectual from New York was so much smarter and knew so much more about the Bible than this Southern gentleman, uh, you know, from the South. And and he was just the worst person to possibly put on the stand. He couldn't answer any of the questions. He didn't know anything beyond just your basic Bible stories, your, your, you know, your, your Sunday school type curriculum. 
And that hot summer, an image was branded into the psyche of Americans that still lasts to this day. It's the image of evolution versus creation. It's the image of the modern versus the old-fashioned. The city versus the country. Intelligent versus ignorant. Science versus faith. And to this day, it's still so common that people look at Christians as anti-science, as backwards, as not as smart as everybody else. Have you ever noticed that? Am I alone in my thesis here? And so I want to ask this question as we get started. Is there really a conflict between faith and science? Is there really a dilemma? Are they really at odds with one another? Because we're going to kind of step into this because some people define faith as like this giant leap in the dark. Like this is faith and I got to close my eyes. I got to be blindfolded. I'm just going to trust and go. Listen, guys, that's not faith. I don't know about you, but that's not what the Bible says faith is. In fact, I can't speak for other religions or anything like that, but the Bible actually has a definition of faith. Many of you guys memorized it when you were young. Maybe you memorized it last week. I don't really know, but Hebrews chapter 11, verse number one is the definition of faith by the Bible. We ask any scholar, what's faith? He's going to point to Hebrews 11, one. Most of you already know this. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. This is what I want you to see. Now faith is the substance, substance, somebody say substance, substance. of things hoped for, the evidence, say evidence. evidence, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is not a giant blind leap into the dark having no idea what's there. Faith is substance and evidence. Faith in God is not a giant leap in the dark. It is substance and and evidence. It is intelligence. God does not expect you to check your brain at the door when you become a Christian. In fact, quite to the contrary, Jesus said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. Mind. God expects you to be intelligent. You certainly do not check your brain at the door, but some of us grew up hearing that, and that's where we get this. Christians are anti-scientific, and they're backwards in the way they think, and, and all this, but faith is substance, and evidence. You can try it. You can discern it. You can, but all of life is that way. Have you ever noticed that? Everything in life is substance. Everything you would call faith. I mean, how do you know the wind is actually there? You can't see the wind, but you got evidence of the wind and the way that it works, the way that it moves. How many of you have ever met LeBron James in this room? I didn't think so. How do you know LeBron James even exists? You've never met him. All that you watch on TV could be a fabricated thing. He may not even exist. Why? Because you have evidence and you have substance that he exists. So it's not irrational to think he exists. Of course he exists. Here's the thing. When it comes to belief in God, it's not that you got to check your brain at the door and just step out in irrational faith. It is a rational faith based on substance and evidence. That's good news for some of you because some of you are scared to think because you're Christians. Don't be that person. So we understand all things through substance and evidence. See, faith and science are not at war as we oftentimes see. I'm going to tell you later on what is at war and where that mindset comes from. In fact, here's a couple quotes. James Tor is a nanoscientist. James Tor says this. He says, only a rookie who knows nothing about science would say science takes away from faith. If you really study science, it will bring you closer to God. Some of you may not even realize this. When science, physical science as we call it today, modern science, was invented, when the idea to study nature came around, I know for most of us we think that's always been that way. It hasn't always been that way. When it came around, when it was invented, when we decided to start studying nature, it was a purely Christian concept. We said we can understand God better if we understand the nature that he created. We can understand the creator if we understand the creation better. That's where science came from. It doesn't take away from God. It actually draws you closer to God. And then, you know, this, this guy you might have heard of somewhere, Albert Einstein. He said, science without religion is lame. Religion without science is blind. <laughs> That's pretty strong. So this is what we're going to do. In this Jurassic series, we're going to look at the evidence and the substance of the things in astronomy and biology. We're going to look at dinosaurs. We're going to look at evolution. It's going to be a lot of fun as we look through a worldview that takes the Bible as one book and science as another book and see where they come together. And I believe you'll be closer to God by being here. I um, also just want to say, 
If you're here and you believe in science, or you're here and you're like, anti, or I'm sorry, if you're here and you believe in evolution, or if you're here and you're against evolution, I, I really don't care, and I'm not taking shots at you either way. Let me be real clear. God is not going to be in heaven one day when you walk through the pearly gates and go, so what's your stance on evolution? See if I can let you in or not. Like, like it's about the blood of Jesus. It's about forgiveness of sins. It is not about what you believe scientifically. <laughs> so, so I'm not here to take shots at you. Um, if you've lost your faith in God because of your faith in science, there's a good chance that's because you've had some bad science or bad theology. Because when you look at them, as we're going to do this morning and the next few weeks, as we look at them in a holistic way, you see they actually come perfectly together, and science will draw you closer to God, as Albert Einstein said. So Genesis chapter 1, verse 24 through 27, Genesis means the book of beginnings. If you want to see what happened in the beginning of the world according to the Bible, you read Genesis chapter 1. So what happens in the beginning? We're going to talk about evolution today, and I want you to see where you see evolution through this. Verse 24 through 27. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds. The livestock, the creatures that move along the ground and the wind animals, the wild animals, not wind animals, wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kind, the livestock according to their kinds, and the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. Notice that word kinds throughout. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and over all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. This is what I want us to note right off the bat. In this conversation, we're going to have about evolution today and have some fun about it. This is what I want us to note. First of all, according to the Bible, God made it. It says that God made it. However, it doesn't say how God did it. Did you see anywhere in there where it told you point blank, these are the details of how it was done? It's not there. We're going to see this next week in, in, in uh, depth. But the book of Genesis in this portion is poetry. That's the way it's written. It's not that it's not meant to be taken literally. It's literal poetry. And so it's not meant to be a detailed description of every sing single thing that went on. So the Bible tells us what God did, but it doesn't tell us how God did it. Therefore, if you want to believe in evolution, go ahead. If you want to believe that that's the way God chose to orchestrate it, lots of great people have believed that. C.S. Lewis, great Christian author, very famous apologist, was, was a big believer in that. See, see, evolution could account for all the animals, but at some point, God did have to make a literal Adam and Eve. They were formed out of the dust of the ground, not something else. So there could have been all the other creatures. There could have been all the other animals. But at some point, there had to be, according to the Bible, a literal Adam and Eve. Could have had all the other stages, but you had to have a literal Adam and Eve. Here's the interesting thing. According to science, not the Bible, according to science, all the DNA of everybody points back to one central person, one mother of all the world, that's what science says, not the Bible. But wait a minute, that is what the Bible says too. Interesting, huh? They both point back to one person, Adam and Eve, one woman who bore the first child that everybody came out of. You know what science calls her? Eve. Interestingly enough, they stole the word from the Bible, the name from the Bible. So science and the Bible, we see once again, both go back to this. So this isn't like some giant leap of faith. This is what we see in the modern science. So the real question that we want to get into today is this. Is evolution as airtight as it seems to be portrayed most of the time? And when I talk about evolution today, I'm talking about what they call neo-Darwinian evolution. It's what you see in your textbooks. This is the way it is from goo to you via the zoo. Started out as the simplest life form and some kind of amoeba that evolved, that evolved, that evolved. And eventually, here you are here today. It's kind of like the uh, teenager that went to his dad and said, Dad, where did we come from? Where did human beings come from? And he said, well, we evolved from primates and monkeys and different things, and, and that's where we came from. We evolved from primates. And he said, okay. Then he went to his mom, and he said, Mom, where did we come from? And his mom said, oh, we, well, God created us special in his image. We have a purpose and a destiny on our life. We were created by God. And he said, but Mom, Dad said that we came from primates and monkeys. She said, oh, that's just his side of the family. <laughs> <coughs> Just a joke to ease the tension. All right. 
Point number one, taking notes. Here we go. Science doesn't say anything scientists do. This is a big thing we have to understand as we get started. Science doesn't say anything scientists do. We frequently use the terminology and we say science says. I may say it this morning. It's just But we do have to realize that science doesn't actually speak. It's not a human. Science doesn't say anything, but scientists do. So scientists study the data, data, and then we filter the data through our own worldview and our own beliefs. If our worldview is skewed, the data will also be skewed. If our worldview is skewed, our data will also be skewed. So what are you talking about? So let's take, for instance, uh, let's say that there was a magician on the stage today and he pulled up Olivia McAnulty and said, I need a, you know, somebody to help me. And they put her in a giant box and he took a big saw and he sawed right down through the two of her and split her in half. How many of you would believe she actually was split in half? I'm glad. None of you. Good. That's good. Because you're going to scare me if you were... Nobody's going to believe that. You know why? Because you have a worldview that says that's impossible. He didn't really do that. All the evidence says he did it. But your worldview says, nope, that's out of the question. There's got to be a trick. There's got to be some way he's, that's got to be an illusion of some sort. There's no way he actually sawed her in half. He wouldn't go to jail for that. But that's what all the evidence actually points toward. That's why magic, when I say illusions, magic, that kind of magic. That's why magic is more powerful to children than adults. Children see somebody sawed in half and they're like, oh, you know, you were really sawed in half. Adults see and we're like, uh, how do they do that? You know, why? Because the children have not yet created a worldview. They're still figuring out the world. They haven't figured it out yet. So your worldview will actually skew what you see and hear in the knowledge. So if your worldview excludes God, say it this way, if your worldview is naturalism or materialism, depending on how you, how you use the words, if your worldview is naturalism, then that means that you only believe in what you can see, touch, smell, the physical things in the universe. If you can't put it under a microscope, it does not exist. That means none of the spiritual world exists. If that's your worldview, it's going to taint how you see the evidence that you're looking at inside of science. And then when you say science says, it's going to be tainted by that worldview. Are you all with me? That's the worldview that's most common in the scientific world. Everything is physical. There is nothing outside of the physical that exists. Therefore, God cannot exist. And if God cannot exist, therefore, I have to be able to solve every problem in the world without using God or any other intelligent designer or any other metaphysical thing out there in the universe. Are you all with me? There is nothing spiritual out there. And once you start using that worldview, it skews, in my opinion, and I'll explain why in just a second, some of what we start to find. In fact, by the way, we, we mentioned this a second ago, but there's a war between faith and science. No, 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 not really. But there very much is a war between faith and naturalism. Because naturalism says all the faith stuff is ignorant and stupid, and it's very close-minded to God. There's very much a war in that. Now, here's the funny thing. Vast, vast, vast majority of Americans agree that there is a spiritual world. There are things outside of the physical world. There, in fact, there are tons of evidence. Some of the newest, most fun stuff you want to read up about it is near-death experiences. Some of the most coolest things you're going to see that's pointing towards there being a spiritual element to life is in that realm of science. But there's all kinds. And that one is radically won by those who believe in a spiritual world. But that's where the, world, the war actually starts to come into place. So number two, is evolution a fact of science? I'm going to give you my perspective. You might have a different one. I would love to sit and chat with you about this if you don't agree. But here's my answer. Yes and no. <laughs> yes and no. Let me begin to explain why. To understand this, you have to understand the difference between microevolution and macroevolution. Microevolution is the way a species with uh, uh, the way a species evolves within the species. It refers to changes that occur inside of the species. Nobody disagrees with microevolution. It's the reason why you can get dogs that are little tiny puppy dogs that look so little they're basically a rat. Come on, y'all. Those little yappy dogs. Yep, 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 yep. And you just want to anyway. And, and those little rat dogs. 
And then you can also get a canine. You can also get a dog that's massive. I was in Alabama a number of years ago, and a neighbor of a family member had, a, had a, like a Great Dane that was the biggest dog I've ever seen in my life. Like he literally looked at me in the face. That's how big the dog was. Massive. Ada was there. She could tell you. It was a massive, massive dog. Didn't even know dogs could get that big. And, uh, and they kept him in the house, which was just crazy. All I could see is like stuff broken everywhere. Just, I mean, he just bumped into everything. He's huge. And, um, but this is the thing. Whether it be a teensy tiny dog or whether it be a great giant dog, it's still a dog. It's still a canine at the end of the day. You cannot actually take that little dog and turn it into a rat. And you can't take that big dog and turn it into a horse, although it's as big as a horse almost, right? You can't do that either. Here's the thing. Microevolution, there's evidence of it everywhere. However, macroevolution refers to the transition or evolution of one species into another completely different species. So this is when the little dog becomes a rat or some other species or the big dog becomes a horse or some other species. Here's the thing. There is absolutely no evidence whatsoever nobody has ever seen or caused macroevolution. It has never been seen or caused. Caused is the big one for me. Uh, if you look it up, and you're welcome to do this because I don't want you to check your brains at the door, go fact check everything I say. Uh, uh, when you look up macroevolution and the greatest examples of macroevolution, what you're going to find over and over and over is that macroevolution actually is microevolution. So they'll say, uh, one of the great examples they use all the time is uh, the moth's um, wings have changed color from brown to white, but it's still a moth. Uh, the finch's beaks have gotten longer, but it's still a bird. Um, and so they use these different things, and they say, oh, there's all this evidence for evolution. There is microevolution, which nobody disagrees with. I mean, look around the room. That's why we have all these different colors and styles. We got red hair and brown hair and blonde hair. We got tall people, short people. We got dark skin, light skin. We got everybody in this room. Why? Because that's microevolution, right? We, we know you, 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 know, you breed, as, <laughs> and you can get different colors, right? Which, by the way, I always mess, I like to mess with people, especially white people, because I love my black friends and the family in the church. Um, how, did you realize, uh, we'll just say it this way, what, what color was Adam and Eve? If you grew up like I did, Adam and Eve was always white. In every coloring book, in every, like, you know, picture, you know, the flannel graph, y'all remember the flannel graph? Adam and Eve was always white, and they had the perfect amount of leaves covering the certain spots. I don't know how they took the picture at that angle all the time, um, but they had the certain amount, and they were always white. Now, maybe you grew up in a different culture, and so he wasn't always white. Here's, I just want to mess with you for just a second. Um, Adam and Eve wasn't white. <laughs> There's two reasons to believe this. Let's take the book of science and let's take the book of God. Science actually points back that the farther it goes back, the darker the skin was. The darker the skin was. Which, by the way, is one of the reasons Charles Darwin was one of the most racist people of that generation because he believed you were less evolved the darker your skin is. I'm not saying that. That's Charles Darwin. But the farther you go back, the darker your skin gets. Interesting. In the Bible, you were made, human beings were made out of what? Dirt. The dust of the ground. Have you ever play or, or plant anything in white dirt? <laughs> Not only that, but inside of the Garden of Eden was what they call the fertile crescent. In other words, uh, it was incredibly fertile ground. It was incredibly fertile soil. The best soil is what color? Black or very dark. The darker the soil oftentimes means the better the soil to plant something in. Adam and Eve were made out of dark soil. I think it's pretty rational to say that they might have been dark colored. I hate to mess with all my white folks, but I'm just saying. All those, all those flannel graphs lied to you when you were a kid. Um, but this is, this is one of the many, many, many examples where you can take the book of the Bible and the book of science and put the two together and go, oh yeah, I see how those just perfectly mesh together. And so microevolution happens all the time. Nobody doubts that. There is tons of evidence for it. If you doubt that, you're probably crazy. That's how you got different sizes of dogs. That's how you got different sizes of everything and different styles of everything. But it's within species that it doesn't change. Now notice the way the Bible said it in Genesis 1 a minute ago. It says that God made them according to their kind or species. And God kept making them according to their kind. So just remember that. So in no case has macroevolution ever been observed or called, caused. Now here's the thing. Um, caused. They would say, oh, it can't be observed because it takes billions and billions of years or millions, depending on who you talk to. Everybody has different answers for that. 
but it takes so long you can't actually see it because it happens so small. Okay, I get that. Here's the problem. Why can't we cause it to happen? With intelligent, smart people, with laboratories and biology today, why can't we, for if it's going to happen by accident, why can't we force it to happen? In fact, we've been trying to do this since the 80s with fruit flies because fruit flies have such a short life cycle and trying to create macroevolution inside of them and every time they end up dying when they get to that place that they would actually become something else because they, help, they hit what's called genetic limits. They can't do it. So if we can't even make it happen, we can't even cause it to happen, which, by the way, if we could cause, would only show that an intelligent designer could make it happen. <laughs> but if we can't even make it happen, how are we supposed to... Uh, you know, believe it just happened all by chance. Now, this is my opinion. You may not agree, and that's perfectly fine. Um, so uh, uh, biologist Michael Denton, Dr. Michael Denton, he says this, neither the two fundamental uh, uh, axioms of Darwin's macroevolutionary theory has been validated by one single empirical uh, discovery or scientific advance since 1859, in other words, since it was put forth. This is not me talking. This is not pastor talking. Uh, what was that, that line from many years ago when some of us were kids? Um, don't take my word for it, kids. You know, Listen, this is not just the pastor. These are doctors who disagree, and we're going to see many of these as we come up. All right, so let me give you three big reasons uh, I don't believe in neo-Darwinian macroevolution. Three reasons I don't believe in it. First one, first life. First life. This is a huge, huge, huge problem if you believe in evolution without God being involved in it somewhere. So for Darwinian evolution to be true, life had to be generated spontaneously from non-living chemicals. This had to be unguided in a complete naturalistic process. Nobody had to be involved. There was no intelligence. Again, we can't make this happen in laboratories, but it was supposed to happen all by itself. And so it had to happen without any humans being involved. And they say, you know, it's a primordial soup and you got these molecules and then it needed a charge so there must have been a lightning hit it and then suddenly, voila, life kind of happened. There's big issues with it. I mean, that's like saying, like my truck got hit by lightning and became Optimus Prime. <laughs> it doesn't work quite that simple. It's, it's not that easy at all, at all. And, and here's the reason why. Here's the problem. First life is not simple. When we talk about the simplest form of life, it's really not simple whatsoever. Um, a single DNA molecule is the basic building block of life. We, we know that. Single DNA molecule holds about the equivalent of 1.5 gigabytes of information. A single DNA, like, like if you've got an iPad and it's only eight gigabyte, that's about five, five DNA molecules in your body. That is a ton of information that's inside of you. Uh, humans have approximately 10 trillion cells. If you were to stretch your cells from here to the earth, I'm sorry, from the earth to the sun, it would go back and forth a hundred times. And there's more DNA inside of each one of those. The simplest amoeba, the simplest living thing, the simplest amoeba has about the equivalent of 300,000 textbooks worth of information inside of it. I, we used to give this illustration back in the day, and we talked about Encyclopedia Britannica. And now I talk about Encyclopedia Britannica, and if you're under like 35, you have no clue what I'm even talking about. You're like, is that like Wikipedia? What's an encyclopedia? <laughs> uh, and here's the, the, this begs this enormous question. It's awesome. Where did all this information come from? There's all this information, and it's not like random encoded. I mean, it's, this is the blueprint of who you are. This is like the, this is like the, 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 the computer uh, um, a model of who you are. This is the computer code for who you are. Where did all this information come from? Richard Dawkins, who's uh, one of the foremost atheists in the world, he's one of the, what they call four horsemen of the atheism. And uh, Richard Dawkins has written some really ugly books towards Christians and very, very aggressively a modern militant atheist. Um, uh, but he's also obviously an evolutionist. Uh, Richard Dawkins says it this way in one of his books. He says, biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. <laughs> Think about that. Biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of being designed for a purpose. Well, if it gives the appearance, why don't you believe it? Do you see the naturalistic worldview? I can't believe it. I can't allow that to come through my mind. Therefore, I have to agree 
uh, therefore I have to stick to the old, the old mindset. Um, and this is what converted Anthony Flew many years ago. Anthony Flew was the leading atheist of, of his time. In fact, the 20th century, he wrote most of the articles and the textbooks that were used in humanist atheist courses in colleges around the world. Anthony Flew was the man when it came to atheism. Towards the end of his life, as they started to get more and more and more information about the molecular machine inside of the shell cell, how detailed it was, how much information was there, it was overwhelming. And the man who was the foremost atheist in the world changed his mind and said, I can't be an atheist any longer. I can't believe it's this simple any longer. It needed something to help it in order for it to continue to grow and for evolution to take place. Therefore, he actually changed and became a deist. He believes there was some sort of intelligence out there. One of the few videos at the end of his life where they talk about this, it's him and a guy by the name of uh, Gary Habermas. And here's a couple quick excerpts uh, from that video. Go ahead, guys, hit that. What were some of the factors that prompted you to, in recent years, um, reconsider atheism and to come to the conclusion that, uh, that there is a intelligence? Um, it's been in entirely these, uh, uh, I suppose, biological discoveries. And uh, discoveries about the, the chemistry so the, it's the, these things. The complexity and... Uh, yeah, the integrated complexity argument. Now, when you talk about the integrated complexity, yeah. is it the, the um, unlikelihood of that developing naturalistically, the first complex integrated biological system? Is that where the problem you saw? Uh, well, yes, because after all... Uh, there is a problem about uh, even well the f of physical nature. There's a, you know it's uh, if the integrated complexity of the physical world is a good reason, as Einstein clearly thought it was, of believing that there was an intelligence behind it, then uh, this arg argument applies a fortiori with the inordinately greater integrated complexity of the living world. Mm -hmm. It seems to me is, this is just obvious that it, th that argument is much stronger now. And this was one of the factors that led you to conclude there must be an intelligence. Yeah, yeah. It, it was uh, uh, th accepting uh, Einstein, who after all was the person who was qualified to judge, and seeing that a fortiori, this applied, uh, where, of course, Einstein didn't uh, have any authority at all and wasn't incli inclined reasonably enough to talk about yeah. it. It's the equivalent of a computer programmer. Your DNA is very much similar to a, a computer program. A computer programmer, if you were to write a program and then at the end of the program or there in the middle you decided I'm just going to start putting ones and O's and X's and O's into the computer program and I'm just going to randomly just type them. Is the computer program going to get smarter and better or is it going to get worse? They are so quiet. It's going to get worse, right? In fact, even the program that worked originally is actually probably going to stop working before too much longer. It's actually going to get a lot worse. Your DNA is the blueprint. It's the program of your life. And it has intricate information about who you are written, encoded in it. It's actually something, and you're going to see this a few times today, that some scientists refer to as the signature in the cell. Even unbelieving scientists call this the signature in the cell because it seems like somebody wrote this code and left it there to be found in such a time as this. Now, what's the odds of this? Check this out. The odds of a single cell coming together by chance are 1 in 10 to the 40,000th power. If you guys who understand, that's 1 in 10 with 40,000 zeros after it. To put that into perspective, the estimated atoms in the entire universe is 1 in 10 to the 70th power. Okay? That is a massive, massive number. This is like monkeys just typing away at a keyboard and writing a book like War and Peace. It's like a tornado going through a junkyard and assembling a Boeing 747. It's like an Apple geek's computer uh, garage blowing up and all of a sudden you have all of Apple technology right there in front of it. It just doesn't make 
sense. Uh, microchemist uh, Michael B. he actually calculated the probability of getting one protein molecule, uh, which is about 100 amino acids, by chance would be the same as a blindfolded man finding one marked grain of sand in the Sahara Desert three times in a row. And one person, and I'm sorry, and one protein molecule is not life. To get life, you need 200 other protein molecules to come together at the same time. Here's the thing. If we can't force it to happen, how's it supposed to happen by chance? So in the, in the face of these incredible odds, that's so unlikely that it actually becomes the point of being impossible, in the case of, in the case of incredible odds, how do people respond to this? And uh, we found this video clip that I think kind of portrays the way people respond about the chances of macroevolution happening all by itself. Hit this video. Maybe I should no, be going. No, 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 I, <laughs> that's not what I meant. <laughs> um, what I meant was, um, I like you, Mary. I like you a lot. <laughs> I want to ask you a question straight out, flat out, and I want you to give me an honest answer. What do you think the chances are of a guy like you and a girl like me ending up together? Well, Lloyd, that's difficult to say, and we really don't... Hit me with it! Just give it to me straight! I came a long way just to see you, Mary. Just... least you can do is level with me. What are my chances? Not good. You mean not good like one out of a hundred? I'd say... More like one out of a million. So you're telling me there's a chance. Yeah! So you're telling me there's a chance. Listen, Michael Denton, the biologist, said neither of the two fundamental axioms of Darwinian's macroevolutionary theory has been validated by one single empirical discovery or scientific advance since 1859. I've read that to you a minute ago, but, but process that. If evolution is true, and you can, you can believe, like I don't, I'm not hating, again, you can go to heaven and believe in evolution. If evolution is true, it desperately needs an intelligent designer to help it along. It desperately needs, we would call it God, you can call it whatever you want, it needs somebody to make it through these different breaks. So, so why would somebody believe something so improbable? Again, this is the war between faith and naturalism because naturalism says we care too close-minded to open our minds that there could be anything beyond the natural world. And that's why you end up with these ridiculous odds, but it has to be that way because that's the only thing we believe in. And do you see where that goes? Gerd Mueller, the Australian evolutionary theorist, he says, not only does Darwin's theory fail to explain how life originated, it also fails to explain how complexity developed. In fact, it doesn't even ask those questions. But those are the questions. That's the questions we need to find an answer to, right? How did all this come alive? Where did it come from? What helped it? How did first life get here? Where did it come from? That is the question. So, when backed into a corner, people that uh, believe in this, uh, when backed into a corner, the most common response is this term that we would call panspermia. Say, what in the world is that? The backed into a corner, the thought comes up, well, obviously something had to help it along. I don't believe in God. Therefore, I have to believe that aliens or some other culture brought it and seeded life on earth. Some of y'all are laughing. Because when you don't believe in God, you have to believe something did it. And I can't put God in the box, but I can put aliens in the box, which, by the way, doesn't even come close to solving the problem because then you got to say, who created aliens? Richard Dawkins, again, is probably the foremost 
uh, probably the most famous atheist in the world. He's a zoologist, brilliant, brilliant guy, and again, written some very ugly things towards Christians. Uh, there's a movie called um, uh, Expelled that, he did, or that Ben Stein did, and he interviews uh, uh, Richard Dawkins during this video, and he kind of presses him into that corner. He, you know, Ben Stein's pretty tenacious and kind of presses him into that corner. And, and I want you to see some of the language that's used by Richard Dawkins to explain first life apart from God. Watch this video. In the book. Well, then who did create the heavens and the earth? Why do you use the word who? You see, you, you, you immediately beg the question by using the word who. Well, then how did it get created? Well, um, by a very slow process. Well, how did it start? Nobody knows how, how it started. We know the kind of event that it must have been. We know the sort of event that, that must have happened for the origin of life. And what was that? It was the origin of the first self-replicating molecule. Right, how did that happen? I told you, we don't know. So you have no idea how it started? No, 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 no nor has anybody. Nor has anyone else. else. What do you think is the possibility that, there, that intelligent design might turn out to be uh, the answer to some issues in uh, genetics or in, well, in evolution? It could come about in the following way. It could be that uh, at some earlier time, somewhere in the universe, a civilization e evolved by probably some kind of Darwinian means to a very, very high level of technology and designed a form of life that they seeded onto perhaps this, this planet. Um, now, th that is a possibility and an intriguing possibility. Mm -hmm. And I suppose it's possible that you might find evidence for that if you look at the, um, at the detail, details of biochemistry, molecular biology, you might find a signature of some sort of designer. Do you guys follow along with that? There might be a signature in the cell. If there's a signature, somebody wrote it. So where did that have to come from? Well, I can't believe in God, so I have to look towards aliens. I believe that aliens will become far more of a common topic in our society in days to come uh, because you need aliens in order to, to make sense of some of the evolutionary theory. All right, number two. Uh, and number two and three will be a little faster. Second reason, second big reason I don't believe in the neo-Darwinian uh, version of evolution. Uh, it's irreducible, com it's, I'm sorry, irreducible complexity. More than one part is needed instantly and in one moment in order for it to function and actually survive. Say, so, what are you talking about? Um, an example of this might be your car or your vehicle, right? Uh, Andre's right here. Um, uh, in order for your car to function and do what it's meant to do, it needs more than a transmission. It needs more than a motor. It needs more than just an alternator. It needs more than just a fan belt. It needs all kinds of things all coming together in the exact same moment. And if one comes together, the whole thing will never move or do anything because it's no good that one could theoretically evolve without the others. Um, Michael Behe puts together the great, Dr. Michael Behe puts together the great example of a mousetrap, a very simple, simple, simple thing. We've all seen or seen known of mousetraps. You got five parts of a mousetrap. You got a hammer, a spring, a holding bar, platform, and the catch. If any one part of those are not there, then the whole thing will not function, right? So you can't have a platform evolve. It would just die because it can't function. It's no good. So you can't just have a catch. You can't have a catch, a platform, and a holding ball bar all evolve at the same time. It would not function. You need everything in the exact same moment to happen at the exact same time. And, and here's the thing with this. In order for the most basic life to come about, you run into a chicken or egg kind of problem. Which came first, the protein or the DNA? Because you need both of them at the exact same moment in order to create life. You can't have one or the other, but they both need each other. Charles Darwin said it this way. He said, if it could possibly, I'm sorry, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. Successive modifications, that's the whole theory of evolution. Go back to the slide again uh, with the mousetrap. Could this mousetrap function by slight modifications? No. It needs everything at one time to all evolve in unity in order for it to do its purpose and survive. Human life is very much the same thing. And by the way, some act like this has been debunked. It has not even been close to debunked. Uh, Michael Behe's argument is very strong and hasn't come close to being debunked yet. Um, you see this in all kinds of stages. We could have fun with simple little funny stages, but like who came first, male or female? 
right? You know, it's creation, you'd say male, but, but the simple fact is you need male and female of whatever organisms that eventually come around. You need male and female to both come at the same time in order to bear offspring. You need the ability to bear offspring to all come at the same time. You need to make sure the, the female is not 70 years old when the male is five years old, right? You need to, you know, balance these things out. It's that irreducible complexity. Everything has to happen at the same time. Time, which is why Dr. Michael B. he says this. He says there has never been a meeting or a book or a paper on details of the evolution, evolution of complex biological systems. So they say, what are you talking about? Of course there has. No, no. He said details of it. In other words, a peer-reviewed, accepted one that we can all agree on. Why? Because nobody knows the details. We jump from here to here. I'm not sure how we got there exactly. We have theories, we have ideas, but nobody can agree on all of them together. All right, number three, the Cambrian explosion. The Cambrian explosion. The sudden appearance of most of the fossil record, which occurred abruptly out of the sedimentary layers, and the fossils show that we went from non-living materials to living materials. There was not just a link missing in between, there's a whole chain missing. When, when I was a kid, when I was in junior high or so, I remember talking about it a lot. I don't know if it was just our classes or what, but there was all this talk of the missing link. I remember people had shirts on that said the missing link, you know, and, and there's all this talk about the missing link. Here's the problem. Not only has the missing link become more missing, the whole chain has become missing in the Cambrian explosion. It's going from this to this with nothing in between on the two to make any sense of it. The absence of the fossil record is astounding. The missing link is still missing. It's often been faked, but it is still very much missing to this day. Um, there has been no legitimate uh, intermediate state animal fossils that have been found. Dr. David Ropp, the paleontologist, says, we have, we have even fewer examples of evolutionary transition today than we had during Darwin's time. Uh, somebody sent me last night a, 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 a study of DNA barcodes, which is studying the DNA of going back in time, and it founds the same thing, that 90% of the animals on the earth seem to appear rapidly, at least by the evolutionary standards, seem to appear rapidly. Uh, the Cambrian explosion, all the sedimentary layers are here, and then suddenly everything comes in. Now, when I say suddenly, I got to be real clear, I'm not talking about suddenly like in our suddenly, like overnight. By the way, they would term it, it's over millions of years. But still, when you look at billions of years, which is where they're starting at, this came overnight. It came rapidly, which makes no sense. Once again, it begs, it needs a theistic God or something to come in and help it along the way. I could talk about cyclical change. I could talk about genetic limits. I could talk about the non-viability of transitional forms and all kinds of other reasons that I don't personally agree with the neo-Darwinian theory. But you can do that on your own. So number three. Number three, and this is where we want to stop and wrap everything up this morning. Some of you are yawning and you're getting tired. More and more scientists are rethinking the neo-Darwinian naturalistic evolution. This is not just the preacher talking. This is the world that we live in. Some of you might have heard of the Royal Society. Royal Society is the grouping of, of scientists and others in uh, Europe. It's kind of the top of the top of the top. I think it was Isaac Newton. Was it Isaac Newton? Isaac Newton was the, uh, 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 presided over the president of it for 25 years. It is the top of the top of the top. They got together uh, about a year and a half ago. It was, uh, I think, November of 2016. They got together, and this was the purpose of their meeting. You can look it up on their website. Developments in evolutionary biology in adjacent fields have produced calls for revision of the standard theory of evolution. Although the issues involved mainly remain hotly contested, this meeting present, presented these developments and arguments and encouraged cross-disciplinary cross discussion, which involved the humanities and social sciences in order to provide further analytical perspectives and explore the social and philosophical implications. Here's what I want us to see. Even those involved in the science field are starting to come around and be honest enough to go, hey, there's some things that have to be revolved. There's things that aren't making sense here. There are some things that we got to put our thinking caps on and figure out and maybe not be so close-minded that we refuse to allow a God in it. Interestingly enough, it was kind of the elephant in the room for this meeting. I heard some reports about this particular meeting. And they said there was oftentimes big debates and, and we have to make sure it's all naturalist. We can't have God in it anywhere. And there was one moment during the debate that a couple people were debating back and forth and one of them stood up and said, said I'm not talking about God here. Well, what does that show? 
we got to close off the door to anything intelligent, anything that could be God, and isolate ourselves without it, which, in my opinion, is very closed-minded. And science, as it proves best, is when it follows the evidence wherever it leads. Some people would say, well, all this stuff you're talking about, all this, uh, you know, the DNA and the, and the signature on the cell, well, that's just God of the gaps. In other words, that's just putting God in places that we have a gap of knowledge. We don't know that what's happened here, so we're just going to put God there. That's not God of the gaps at all. That's actually positive evidence for a designer. When you see a code written in DNA, that's not going, we don't know what happened. That's going, somebody put a code there. And it seems to make sense that it could be God. So as we kind of wrap up, let me give you a couple quotes, just so you don't take my word for it alone. Dr. Jerry Coyne of the Department of Ecology and Evolution uh, and Evolution at the University of Chicago, he says this, we conclude unexpectedly that there is little evidence for the neo-Darwinian view. Its theoretical foundations and the experimental evidence supporting it are weak. That's not me talking. Um, Soren Lovthrop, the former professor of zoology at the University of Yuma in Sweden, he's actually passed away now. He said, I believe that one day the Darwinian myth will be ranked the greatest deceit in the history of science. Now, I'm not, I'm not hating on, on evolution. I'm not, I'm not like trying to bash evolution. I'm just telling you what they're saying. Francis Collins is like the stud of science in the United States. He is the man. He was the head of the Human Genome Project. Many of you have heard of that. They're going down, down the DNA one at a time. He is the man. He said this. He said, there is no way you can walk away without saying this is God's elegant plan. Francis Collins also says, faith is reason plus revelation. And the revelation part requires one to thank with the spirit as well as with the mind. You can hear the music, not just read the notes on the page. He also says later on, he says, I actually do not believe that there are any collisions between what I believe as a Christian and what I have learned about as a scientist. This is where I want to end that. And I've said this a few times. This is what I love about Christianity. God calls you to love him with all of his mind, with all of your mind. And so you hold the Bible with one hand and you hold the book of science with one hand and you can see where the two integrate together when you look at it through a proper worldview. And we're going to see this repeatedly throughout this whole series. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And at the heart of this question is the question of were you designed on purpose or are you a cosmic accident? If you are just a molecular machine, and, and we could go at length about this. I have a degree in philosophy. I love to talk on this subject. If you are just a molecular machine, you have no free will. You have no purpose in life. You, didn't, you have no free will. You didn't decide to come here this morning. You might have thought you did, but you didn't actually decide. You just did whatever your molecules told you to do. But if you are designed and created... God gives you a free will to make choices. God allows you to have a purpose and a destiny over your life. You were created on purpose for a purpose. So three big ideas as, as we wrap up. Number one, faith is not blind or stupid. It does not require you to check your brains at the door. I'm sorry that some of you grew up in religious environments where it was like, just believe this and don't ask questions. I tell you the exact opposite. Ask away. God is not intimidated or scared by your questions. So ask away. I'm here. I love answering questions. If I don't have the answers, we can talk about the answers. We'll get together. I don't have to have all the answers. And I'm not that smart. But I love to talk. I love to reason things out with people. So don't think faith is stupid. You don't have to check your brains at the door. In fact, quite the opposite. The biggest people that made the biggest difference in the world over the last 2,000 years were people that followed the teachings of Jesus Christ. Love the Lord your God with all your mind. Number two, belief in evolution does not mean you cannot be a Christ follower. So the world that I grew up in, it was like, if you believe in evolution, you're one of them. Listen, you can believe in it. Like when you get to heaven, God's not going to stop you at the gate and be like, yeah, you know, evolution, yay yeah, or nay. Where's what you... It, that's about blood. It's about the resurrection. You can believe in it. Now, I think there's some huge problems. And if you believe in evolution, in my, my opinion is that you definitely need to believe in theistic evolution that God helped it out. But you can believe whatever you want to believe. I don't care. Just think about it and keep thinking about it and never get closed minded to think I figured it all out. As soon as you think you figured it all out, we don't know anything. And that includes me. And then number three, 
you were created on purpose and for a purpose. I believe that according to the Bible and according to science, you can put the two together and say, God created you special and unique on purpose and for a purpose. And if you really want to find out your purpose in life, you have to go to your creator to find out why he put you on this earth. Did you guys enjoy that this morning? <laughs> Again, um, if you disagree with me, do me a favor, come talk to me. Let's have lunch. Because this is what happens so often is people, they disagree instead of, instead of talking it out, then they just argue. And then they just want to post stuff that's like stupid on social media or, you know, somebody going to post something on this YouTube video and they're going to say something dumb. And just come talk. Let's, let's find the truth together. One way, you don't have to agree with me. All right, next week, um, we are going to have so much fun. I'm just, I'm just going to mess with you for a second. So here's the question. How old is the earth? Is it billions and billions and billions of years old? Is it 6,000 years old? Is it somewhere in the middle? How old is the earth? Now, I'm going to give you an answer next week that you might not expect. We're going to have some fun with it. And so how old is the earth? As well as, did dinosaurs ever walk with human beings? There are some passages in the Bible that actually look like they're talking about dinosaurs. People don't realize this. It's actually in a portion of the Bible that you try to read really quickly because it's not so fun. But we're going to unpack those and look at those. You can believe it or not, whatever. I don't care if you believe the dinosaurs or not. I'm just going to unpack them and show you those to you. And so we can have some kind of, it's going to kind of have some fun with that. You know, did God create in a literal six days or was it a portion of time? What was all that? We're going to look at all that next week. It's going to be awesome and so much fun. We're going to put our thinking caps on, look at the Bible and look at science and see where those two meet up. Can we pray? Father, we thank you, Lord, that you didn't call us to be dumb. God, you called us to study, to learn, to show ourselves approved unto God. Lord, and that's not just studying the word of God, that's studying all of creation that you gave us that points towards you. I'm reminded that the psalmist said, the heavens declare the glory of the Lord. God, let us be able to look at these things and see your glory and see little glimpses into our creator from the creation. Lord, we thank you for it. We praise you for it. God, I pray that we chew on this this week. Lord, that things that stirred us, things that might have frustrated us, things that we might have loved, whatever it is, God, I pray that we chew on it this week and we come up to the answers as we chew on it, as we work it out in our own minds. In Jesus' name, we